This video is the first of two in which I will discuss the topic of distributive justice. Let's begin by looking at the vast inequalities that exist in our society. Here are the five richest Americans in 2022. As you can see, their net worth is almost unimaginable, calculated in the hundreds of billions of dollars. The question is, is this a just state of affairs? Is there something wrong with the fact that some people have these obscene amounts of money while others of us struggle to provide basic needs for our families? Well, maybe we should back up and clarify what we mean by the word just. At a first approximation, justice involves giving people their due. That is giving them what you owe them, what is theirs by right, whether that's good or bad. Justice is typically contrasted with what we call charity or generosity. Charity means giving people more good things than you owe them. Giving people what you owe them isn't generous. Generosity begins only where justice ends. Now, our question isn't about whether the very rich should be generous or charitable to those less well off. Our question is about justice. It's about what we owe each other. Now, philosophers refer to this as distributive justice. Distributive justice refers to the principles of justice dealing with the political processes and socioeconomic structures that affect the distribution of benefits and burdens in societies. More simply, it asks the question, what do we owe each other when it comes to money, material resources, and other social benefits and burdens? Let's bring this topic into focus by way of a thought experiment. Imagine a billionaire, let's call him Dives, who lives in a palatial mansion. D Dives is selfish, but he's never cheated to get his wealth. Outside his gate is an upright man named Lazarus, who is sick, sick starving, and destitute. This scenario raises the following questions about distributive justice. Does Dives owe Lazarus anything? If so, what does Dives owe Lazarus? And why does Dives owe this to Lazarus? Let's now consider four different theories or principles of distributive justice that different philosophers might espouse and what those principles imply about Dives and Lazarus. First of all, the first principle of distributive justice that we might consider is a welfare-based distribution. On this kind of principle, we owe people whatever they need in order to fare well. Now, let me give one caveat. I've presented this as a principle of justice regarding what we owe the needy, but you could also present this as a principle merely of benevolence in general, a principle about um, simply what we ought to give people. You could construe this either as a principle of justice in terms of what we owe to the needy, or simply a principle of benevolence about what we should give them regardless of whether we owe it to them or not. Now, one of the most well-known welfare-based theories is called utilitarianism. Excuse me. <clears throat> utilitarianism says that the right action is the action that will maximize the sum total of happiness in the long run. So according to utilitarianism, Dives should give Lazarus whatever resources will raise his happiness level without decreasing the happiness of others even more. I hope you can see what's attractive about utilitarianism. After all, we want the world to be happier, right? Utilitarianism just says, put your money where your mouth is. You might think that only selfishness would make us hesitate from embracing this policy. However, there are several well-known objections to utilitarianism that have nothing to do with selfishness. First of all, it seems difficult, maybe impossible, to calculate the impact of an action on the long-term happiness of the world. Secondly, utilitarianism is completely impartial. That sounds good, but it implies that it is wrong to privilege the happiness of myself or my family or my friends or neighbors over the happiness of any other sentient being in the universe. So for example, uh, you have just as strong an obligation to give gifts to bunny rabbits as to your children on their birthdays. 
Utilitarianism, thirdly, focuses only on future happiness. It ignores what people deserve on the basis of their past actions. And that can sometimes be disquieting. And finally, classical utilitarianism only aims to maximize happiness. It ascribes no intrinsic value to things like friendship, knowledge, beauty, freedom, and so forth. However, the words on the last slide apply specifically to classical utilitarianism. So it's possible that we could devise another kind of welfare-based theory that avoids these objections. And I leave that to you to consider. The second theory of distributive justice I wanna consider is dessert-based distribution. According to this theory, each person should get what he deserves. And of course, I hope you can see the appeal of this theory too. After all, if I've worked hard and worked honestly, don't I deserve a proportionate reward for my labor? Now, let me make one clarifying point about the concept of dessert. Dessert is not necessarily the same thing as entitlement. For example, if you are duly elected president in a fair and honest election, then you are entitled to that office. However, you might not deserve to be president. Maybe you are a complete scoundrel who has simply been elected because the voters are idiots. Of course, I'm not suggesting that, that could ever happen in the United States of America. I'm just trying to illustrate the difference between dessert and entitlement. Now, all of this raises a crucial question. On what basis does anyone deserve anything? What is the basis of dessert? Let's consider four possible answers you might give to that question. And of course, there might be more. Uh, first of all, you might think that the basis of dessert is contribution, that people should be rewarded for their work activity according to the value of their contribution to the overall stand standard of living in society. You might think that the basis of dessert is effort, that people should be rewarded according to the effort that they expend in their work activity. You might think it's compensation. People should be rewarded according to the costs that they have incurred in their work activity. <clears throat> and finally, you might think that the basis is virtue. People should be rewarded for their overall level of moral virtue. Now, as appealing as the dessert-based theory may be, it raises several difficult questions. For example, what is the appropriate basis for determining what people deserve? Is it one of those four? Is it something else? Um, how do we determine that? Second, is it possible to, to measure how deserving someone is? For example, how do we measure how hard someone has worked or how much their work has contributed to society? And finally, who is obligated to give each person what they deserve? Just because you deserve an ice cream cone from somebody doesn't necessarily mean that I ought to be the one who gives it to you. Why do you deserve to have my ice cream cone rather than uh, Jim's ice cream cone or Jill's ice cream cone? Uh, wh whose ice cream cone do you deserve? Or they're, they're not just laying around on the ground. Again, maybe there are solid answers to these questions available, but I leave it to you to think of what they are. The third family of distributive justice principles that I want to talk about is equality-based distribution. Now, there are several different variations on the equality theme. Let's look at three of them. First of all, equal formal opportunity. On this principle, each person ought to have an equal legal opportunity to compete for positions that yield wealth. So we all have to play by the same rules. This kind of equality is fairly uncontroversial, at least in America. We tend to take it for granted that everybody should have the same chance to compete for jobs and positions and all that goes with them. But of course, just because everybody is allowed to compete doesn't mean that everybody has an equal chance of succeeding let alone that everyone will win. 
Maybe Dives was born into a family of successful stockbrokers who set him on track to wealth from his earliest youth. Lazarus, meanwhile, might have been born into poverty and perhaps has significant health problems that have limited his ability to work in the most lucrative fields. Dives could still end up rich and Lazarus end up destitute. So a more rigorous equality principle might try to amend this situation. Equal, subst equal substantive opportunity is a principle that says each person should be compensated for any disadvantages that aren't their fault. For example, lack of natural talents or of inherited wealth, bad social environment, bad education, so forth and so on. This principle demands not only that we all play by the same rules, but that we all start the race from the same starting line. This principle would demand that we somehow compensate Lazarus for any disadvantages of his situation so that he has the same chance as Dives at winning the jobs and positions to which wealth is attached. Another sports metaphor that is commonly used to capture this idea is leveling the playing field. If you Google that phrase, you'll find plenty of illustrations. The first site I found is of an organization called levelingtheplayingfield.org, whose mission is to redistribute equipment to expand access and equity within youth sports and recreation programs in under-resourced communities. Now, if you think that distributive justice requires equal substantive opportunities, then that kind of project isn't just an act of charity. It's obligatory. It is demanded by justice itself. Now, even if we all have equal formal and substantive opportunities, we still might not all succeed for various reasons. So an even simpler but more rigorous equality principle demands equal outcomes. According to this principle, each person should have an equal amount of wealth. In other words, at the finish line, everybody should tie for first place. So on this theory, if Lazarus has nothing, then Dives owes it to Lazarus to give him half of the wealth in his possession so that now they're equal. You might be thinking of questions or objections to these theories already. Let's start with some questions about equal substantive opportunity. First question is this, how do we measure people's relative advantages and disadvantages? Seems tough. Second, how do we adequately compensate someone for the disadvantage of say, having been born into a bad family situation. Third, as long as we all have a chance to make a living, why is it important that we all have the same chance at getting wealthy? Fourth, why is the accumulation of wealth and possessions the most important competitive race that we run in life? Why not also compensate people for their faultless disadvantages when it comes to, say, finding love or acquiring knowledge. Again, I leave it to you to think of possible answers to these questions. The equal outcomes theory also faces challenges, such as the following. If, if we all have enough resources for a reasonably healthy life, then what's the harm in some people having more than others? Second, given the opportunity, some people will accumulate more wealth than others, it seems. Keeping everyone equal seems to require constant interference in people's lives and liberty. Third, it seems that not everyone deserves to have the same amount of wealth. And finally, arguably, equality disincentivizes hard work and innovation, and it lowers the standard of living for everyone. In the next video, we're going to look at one more variation of the equality principle, which is called the difference principle, famously defended by the philosopher John Rawls. We'll also look at an entitlement theory of distributive justice, specifically the theory defended by Robert Nozick. So I'll see you then.